And uh, we're going to start this morning with Ron Simbari from Allstate Asphalt. I'm going to give a brief, a uh, very brief perspective on the industry um, and just uh, contracting from an industry perspective. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always good to come to these meetings to be face to face with the people you work with. I think we have a tendency, uh, even on my side, and I always was critical of industry when I was in, uh, in the agency side about being too internally focused. And I think even agencies, we can be too internally focused. So I think, I think these opportunities to exchange ideas, thoughts are good. Um, I think with technology, we've, got, we've become pretty poor communicators, and uh, I think the meetings like this really help. Larry and I were just, just talking about that. So I'm, I'm only going to be about uh, 15 or 20 minutes, so uh, just a little bit about where all states operates. The Northeast primarily, and uh, like Brian said, um, I'm, I'm out of Maine. This is not a reflection of Maine DOT at all. I do a lot of contracting work in Vermont, New Hampshire, Mass, uh, minimal in Connecticut really, um, and a little bit in Rhode Island I get involved, but uh, nowadays I, I primarily focus on the operations in Maine. Um, also have a terminal, a uh, newer terminal here in New Haven, Connecticut. Interesting fact, one thing I like to tell people, you know, I know Maine, people think Maine's the end of the earth, it's, you know, I know a lot of people don't even realize it's a state for some reason. Um, not people in this room, but uh, we do have something interesting. The first asphalt paved superhighway, that actually existed in Maine in 1947 it was built uh, when, they, when they built the uh, Maine Turnpike. And uh, you know, Rod Burtzall always tells me how well everybody used to dress at work and, and boy he's right, these guys are, these guys all dress and gals very well. Uh, so I don't have a tie on today, you'll have to apologize, I apologize. I'm, uh, a little claustrophobic, so I just don't like that, you know, that tie. So, Rod, you weren't lying. Everybody used to definitely. You were probably there. Stop it. <laughs> All right, just a brief outline. Uh, just going to talk about from a contracting perspective. We, you know, um, you know, I want to talk about some things that are important to contractors as far as planning and forecasting. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the design. I used to be a highway designer when I was with Maine DOT, um, and I see, I see some challenges with integrating typical standards and specs with preservation type treatments. We'll talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about construction and also uh, communication. From an industry expectation, um, we don't have a tremendous amount of expectation in regards to your planning and forecasting. That's obviously everything you guys do in the background. Um, with your pavement management software, managing your network. But one thing we really, really need to know is uh, some timelines in regards to uh, treatments, uh, anticipated scope, work that you're projecting, and advertise dates. These things are really, really important to industry. Um, it's how we make business decisions, especially bidding in a multi-state environment and with preservation. Uh, that's really important really important to, uh, to the contracting industry. Also, long-term plans, you know, we really need to know funding-wise, where are you headed? Uh, what, are, what are we going to look for so we can budget? Um, I unfortunately have uh, uh, profit and loss responsibility today, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely good to know when, uh, where things are headed uh, with funding and work. Kind of a busy slide, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to really look at it. I'm just going to talk a little bit about some, some limits that I see out there. You know, with your, t let's just say a typical interstate project, we have a lot of recognized risk to the traveling public when it comes to drop-offs, when it comes to centerline elevations, motorcycle hazards, uh, hazards in regards to, you know, different obstacles out there with construction, bridge work. Um, one thing I think we need to do is, is really understand with preservation how we really limit, we really limit that exposure to the, not only the contractor but to the agency. Um, and in doing so, we need to recognize that our special provisions need to reflect that limited risk. Um, I see, quite often I see standard specifications in states that really don't address that new lower anticipated risk factor. So something I think you should be looking at is closure lengths, too sh short for uh, fast-moving operations. You know, I think a lot of times, you know, traffic 
you know, they want to they wanna tighten up closure lengths, but they don't re necessarily recognize the fast pace of the operations that are out there, okay? Um, I know Sean Smith in his main DOT report, um, you know, talked about how many miles on 295 we were paving a night. We were paving six plus miles a night in one direction. So I think those, those are important things to be looking at. Matching requirements as far as center line elevation, drop-offs, you know, those drop-offs are gonna, that are gonna be out there are gonna be uh, at a much uh, less risk to the traveling public, to motorcycles. Is there still a risk there? Absolutely. But the risk is not gonna be out there very long. Uh, much shorter than a typical full depth pavement rehab. So definitely be thinking about that. Striping requirements. I see this a lot because, you know, I think especially when you realize that we're out there doing six miles in a night, and, and one disconnect that I see is, you know, that, you know, the agency may uh, necessarily be looking for simply centerline de delineation where the project level is trying to get you to put full uh, actual uh, temporary pavement markings out there. So I think that's, that needs to, between design and construction, understand what's the intention. Are we trying to relay? full pavement markings or are we just looking for center line delineation? And make sure again that those standard specs and the special provisions address those shorter duration and lower impact to the work area. So also something that's, that can be difficult with preservation jobs from a contracting perspective is uh, continuous work spec. If we have a lot of uh, interim completion dates or if we have crack seal out that has a 14-day cure period, let's say, uh, in, its, in your specification, those, there may not be enough items for continuous work spec. So that's something that I see a lot and uh, uh, sometimes it's an issue to, uh, to discuss that with the agency, other, other times it's not. So it's just something to be aware of. Uh, scope creep, this is one that I think, uh, I know a lot of you in here don't really have full control of the whole process right from pavement management to planning uh, to you know design advertise but something that I really see I see a lot of scope creep where all I call it all of the departments pile on you know there's a project out there they know it's on I-95 and safety or traffic will say oh we have uh, we got a rock slope we want to cut back or there's a bike path we, we'd like to we actually saw this in New Hampshire and I have a slide from New Hampshire you know, so the original intention and trying to understand economy of scale and, and, and uh, preservation contractors' ability to deliver work and how it's impacted by some of these scope creeps, I'll, I'll show you here in a minute. You know, I know Maine at one point had, and I, can't, I don't know if it was the old Jeff Adams rule, you guys uh, would know better than I, but um, at, at some point there was a, an established protocol for preservation work in regards to 80 or 90 percent bituminous items. You recall that? Was that was that with the three quarter overlay programs or the level two overlay programs, Scott? I remember we were, I was as the designer measured. Track it. But I track it. Okay. Design. Yeah, and I always thought that was a good idea because it 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 turns your focus back to, okay, what's the intention of this project? Okay, and certainly there are a lot of needs in the department that outweigh uh, the need for you know my company to go out or or any particular contractor to go out and be uh, you know, um, efficient and get in, get out. Uh, but it's certainly something that impacts pricing and, uh, and certainly should, uh, should be understood, I guess. The bridge work should maintain also a, cons a consist consistent uh, flow or scope with the projects. Uh, I've seen bridge work inserted in preservation projects that literally the bridge work in and, in and of itself dictates the, the entire scope of the project and schedule. You close down one lane, you're not coming within any, any, anywhere near that bridge, probably three miles either side to do any work. So it really hampers the paving process. Nobody wants to go in, move in, move out, do bridge work. Certainly understand the challenges that Sean was talking about in regards to bridge abutments. And, uh, I've, always ha I've had those same issues in other states where brand new bridges, for some reason they can build a beautiful bridge. Obviously it's gonna hold traffic and uh, you know, it's gonna be uh, structurally sound. But for some reason, the, uh, the concrete headers and joints on both sides do not match the profile of the road, which still to this day is uh, you know, baffling how, why we can't get that to happen. 
So that's certainly something that from a, from a contracting perspective, that bridge work can really dictate the entire uh, uh, schedule on the project. Here's a, here's a slide. This is one that Eric provided to me. Thank you, Eric Thibodeau. And if you look at, at this, he compares two projects, and this is one of the preservation challenges he has. And I've seen this in more states than, than just New Hampshire, where uh, Eric had a uh, 21 and a half mile project. It was a bonded wearing course, uh, certainly going to get uh, good pricing because of the economy of scale there. Um, I think we've talked about that with some of the uh, experience that New Hampshire, uh, excuse me, Vermont's had. And uh, Eric was trying to model something very similar. By the time design and all other departments piled on, the project had 110 items on it. I think it had a, was that the one that had a ramp reconstruction, lighting, um, I think there was under drain installation. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of work that was outside of the scope of the project. So this, this went from a project where, you know, most preservation contractors' ability to GC also matches our ability for production. Okay, so those things go well in hand, and that's the way we staff our, our projects and, and, and the company. So when you are out there and you're going to run a job for four months to do eight days of paving, that's going to be here, you know, that's going to be very tough from a, a, a cost standpoint. So that's going to add a lot of unnecessary costs. Typically, we're going to be a sub on that project. Anytime you're, you have multiple subcontractors, there's going to be uh, some cost to do so, okay? But it's uh, in comparison, if you look just below that on number two, Main DOT did a 43-mile project with only 30 bid items. Okay, so um, certainly the, the scope creep on that job is what Eric was trying to relay. And I think he, I think you uh, mentioned that to your front office. And I don't know if anything's improved, Eric, but I've seen some improvements this year. I certainly have seen some scope creep too. But design specification. I want to talk a little bit about prep work. And one of the gentlemen, uh, one of the vendors here, talked about the use of mastic. And um, I'm, in, I'm very much encouraged uh, with this product. I think it really it provides a huge tool uh, for some structurally sound uh, repairs. And I think it really helps the overall life of, uh, of some of these uh, different projects. So certainly, let's not skip on it. You know, I, one thing with the economy of scale I've seen that if we go out and we try to do a 20 mile project, we want to apply a single standard to it, be, be flexible to go out and look at that job and say, okay, you know, this project was likely built in multiple uh, projects originally, maybe even overlaid in different years. Uh, we may need to do more intense work to a particular section and need to do some inlays or need to do some repairs, spot repairs. Um, you know, I certainly don't, that's certainly not outside the scope of a preservation job, and it really helps those, those long projects shine as far as uh, overall, um, you know, uh, durability and service life. And I, I think it's important that, you know, uh, I've seen districts and I've seen uh, internal forces do work. Um, make sure those, those forces understand good construction practices. Make sure that those, that prep work is being done properly, because again, poor prep work um, or improper prep work is going to provide shorter service life. Um, I can't stress uh, some of the prep work, and I think Maine DOT and uh, New Hampshire is, and Vermont have seen um, the benefits of that. I want to talk a little bit about IRI ride spec. We do, we do about 25% uh, contracts, or we bid on about 25% of contracts that contain IRI specs. And one thing from a contracting perspective that I think is good to know, if you're developing that, and I saw that in a couple of the state reports, uh, industry really, to, to make some, uh, some judgments and to understand the risk, if you can provide that data years ahead so that they understand the treatment, the initial, initial IRI, post IRI, and, and share that with industry so that, so that when that IRI hits the table, uh, there's not a lot of uh, excitement. We had a project on Route 3 in Mass. It was a lo very long project. It was one of the first uh, ride projects that we, that we had done. And, it was a, and the penalties could have been quite large, and the bonuses could also have been quite large. So you know, one, one thing we were able to do is reach out to Mike Fowler with Vermont. And Mike sent us a fair amount of their data that had been collected over the years. So we, 
we had a good understanding of pre and post ride. Uh, so as you're developing this, again, partner with the industry, share this to them. I'm not so sure PWL is the right thing, considering how large some of these projects are. If you're paving over sections with varying condition, uh, you might want to look at an average ride. Um, so again, take, take a look at that and share that with industry. Some basics under, in regards to advertising and bidding. I think the thing the states don't realize necessarily is that as an owner, you guys compete with each other, okay? So if you can, if you can relay to industry the work, again, timing, schedule, industry will be able to respond. And uh, to be honest with you, some of the things that dictate pricing are our capacity, competition, uh, how much work we have on the books at the time and owners that do a good job balancing risk and reward in regards to specifications um, and owners that also provide good communication to the contractor. Those things are quantifiable uh, value to the contractor. And uh, good communication, again, as issues arise, okay? Um, completion dates and interim completion dates, you know, as you're anticipating those uh, advertising schedules, if, if we understand if you have a project with special dates that need to be done or, or if, uh, for any particular reason, again, that's, that's a great information for us to have. And with RFIs, I see this in a lot of states, that um, the intention with that is to gain some, some insight into some of the questions or ambiguities that, that we may see in plans or plan sets. I think. I think the RFI process is not used enough. Um, I think we, should, we need to be a little better about communicating back and forth with questions, thoughts, and uh, certainly is not a critique on plan sets or, um, or the contract in general. In regards to construction, again, I talked a little bit about bridge work. Uh, numerous in, in, interim completion dates can really hinder uh, our ability to be uh, productive provide you a good value. And I think it's, under, it's really good for you to understand the um, production capabilities with that particular system or treatment and model applications and or specifications to gain the most leverage and cost benefit okay, of that operation. Uh, again, I see a lot of special provisions that don't recognize uh, the treatment's ability um, in regards to production. And, uh, and you certainly want to gain that, uh, that value. And again, good specs provide a value for both the owner and contractors. There, there may be a better way to address an issue if a contractor has some concerns with a spec. You know, again, I think good communication, sitting down and discussing the issue, and maybe there's a better way to, to address the owner's concern. So certainly be, uh, be upfront and uh, discuss those and have those frank discussions. And active feedback to the contractor, I think, is probably one of the things that's really important um, in regards to the contractor and understanding risk. And I think that's also good as you provide, as you start a program, to really understand your expectation of quality. So if you, if there's work out there that there's a concern with, certainly, or non-conforming work, certainly, uh, reach out and, and have that uh, that feedback immediately, or provide it. And something I think that I, I see a lot of times with uh, with some of the preservation jobs there. They, they, can, they can vary widely in regards to areas and districts in the state. And I don't think we always do a great job selling that district or the, that construction office on the benefits, understanding the treatment, understanding the service life, understanding the life cycle cost, and, and really having them being part of carrying the baton when it goes to construction. I think that's extremely important. You know, it's kind of like onboarding a new employee. You, you need to really onboard that product or that process with that new, uh, you know, construction manager, project manager, district manager, whoever that may be. Get their buy-in, you know, provide them the information they need, and I think that really goes a long way uh, for the successful uh, implementation of some preservation work. And one of my final slides is just partnering and communication. I think, I, I think we have, uh, We've got one big challenge in front of us where we definitely like to define the work, go out and do it, but there are a lot of times where we come up with uh, particular things that may uh, provide improvements to the job. Certainly be open to discuss those, uh, take a look at that. You're obviously the owner, but I think that work uh, should be discussed if, if, if there's some major improvements that can be made. 
And I think uh, working groups to improve specifications, as long as they are productive, are extremely important with industry. It's good to be more externally focused as agencies, partner with industry, and, and I think that helps build some relationships, some understanding with what is going to drive your cost slash benefit. Uh, if there are quality concerns or if there are production concerns or safety concerns, that's a good time to bring them up um, with a particular contractor or, in, or with industry by and large. Um, certainly don't, don't be afraid to do that. And I think something, whenever you start a, a, a particular project, and again, I go back to uh, sending a project to a new district, onboarding the expectations and what defines quality of, of whatever you're going to be doing, I think, is in relaying that to the staff so it hits the project is, is, is crucial. I see a huge disconnect there. You got a lot of knowledge with the individual in the central office, you know, implementing that treatment or that project, but it seems to be a big disconnect uh, when it gets to that regional area out on construction. And don't be afraid to innovate. I, I really liked the Federal Highway uh, presentation uh, the first day. You know, we've we've got to continue to try new things, and I'll give a lot of the states uh, credit in, here in the room that they've been pretty open. As long as there's some good data or something we can bring forward, like Brian was saying, we've uh, been able to do a lot of different things. So we, let's continue to do that. That's where it makes what we do uh, exciting and uh, continue to improve what we do. And relations with industry. I, I guess I would say, and I was probably just as uh, guilty as this when I was at the industry, if, if you haven't talked to your industry partners in the last few months, if you haven't picked up the phone and called, called them, I would think about that because those are the people who are delivering your work. No matter what it may be, just a quick phone call, discussion, those kind of relationships uh, can build a lot of value for the department, okay? And I think we can all learn from each other if we listen to each other. Again, I think we, uh, we need to be more externally focused. And then a post-construction discussion, not, not necessarily, I know in Maine we do like a post-pave, but really a post-construction discussion. Um, uh, if, if you guys could facilitate one with the construction people, um, you know, in your agency, yourself, the contractor, talk about what took place that you may get a lot of good feedback in regards to uh, applicable special provisions that could be changed or modified to recognize some of the different things we've talked about. And a successful uh, project is right on the way. That's an AR chip seal in New Hampshire. So just in summary, I think we do need to educate and continue to sell preservation internally. I guess active construction inspection, you know, and, and good feedback to the contractor really provides value to the agency. Continue to improve specifications. And again, special provision uh, should reflect uh, scope slash exposure on uh, preservation projects. Again, we need to listen more and to communicate better. And pricing for preservation work uh, is, is always continually refined with industry as they understand their costs. So if you put out your first few jobs and you don't see the exact uh, you know, uh, uh, estimate that you were expecting, you know, uh, industry needs time to understand their costs, and that's something that I've come to learn also. And I think Maine, New Hampshire, I think you guys have seen that from your early projects, just some of the things you're doing now. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.